All right. So this is the fifth installment of what we're calling Ambassadors Training Camp. And last time we did one of these lessons, we talked about how to study your Bible for yourself, how to actually study it yourself on your own. And we talked about some, some ways and things to do this. And the reason we're doing this series is we're focusing on fundamental things that people need to know. And as I go through these lessons, I know some people are probably thinking, you know, we know this, we know this. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people are not grounded in the fundamentals. I got a question in our email inbox yesterday from a person who says, I'm a grace guy, I'm a mid ax guy, I'm a member of the body of Christ. And then the question he asked me told me he's not grounded in the fundamentals. He was being swayed away into a strange doctrine because he wasn't grounded in the fundamentals. So this thing is important. These basic eternal truths that we need to be rooted and grounded in. And the reason is here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we can become the spoils of war. We can become useless as ambassadors for Christ if we're swayed into these things. Well, how do I, how do I beware? How do I guard against this? It's, it's in the verse right before that. Look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So we're rooted and established in the basics and the fundamentals. It's a safeguard to guard us from being swayed into wrong things. Now, with that being said, we're here talking about God. Essentially, our purpose in coming here is to fellowship with regards to God, to worship Him, to learn about Him, to talk about God and His will. That's the reason we're here, aren't we? Amen. It's not just a social club. We have a purpose. We're here with like-minded people who believe the same things about God and God's will. And we have God's book here. We memorize verses in God's book. We learn how to rightly divide God's book. So the question is, how long would you be able to talk if someone came up and asked you or a child asked you, who is God? Can you tell me about God? What is God? What is God like? What are His attributes? How long would you be able to talk? <laughs> How many verses would you be able to show somebody? When you ask a question like that, who is God or what is God? You ask a million different people that question, you'll get about 999,999 different responses, won't you? You ask a, a Muslim, who is God? And they're going to start talking about Allah and Muhammad. You ask a Hindu to tell you about God, well, they've got something like three million different gods in the Hindu religion. Some people and this is becoming more and more popular in our country, they've heard the phrase, God is love, so many times, they've turned it around. Now they've turned it into, love is God. The only thing that matters is love. There's no such thing as right and wrong anymore, it's just love. But we're here talking about the God of the Bible. Another view of God now is, is God is this universal energy force. You know, it's like we've watched too much Star Wars. <laughs> May the force be with you. And God is this energy and this force that permeates through everything, and you have to find ways to tap into the God force, the life force. Has anybody ever heard things like that? Other people, they make the creation God. God is in the earth. God is in the plants. God is in the animals. God is in the water. God is in you. The creation is God. That's not new. That's called pantheism. 
It's been around a long time. But we've made a decision. I believe this is God's book. God wrote it. This is his word. What, who is the God in this book? That's what we need to be rooted and grounded in. So who is God? What is he like? First of all, does, is there a God? You know, that's, when we know our Bible says the fool is set in his heart, there is no God. But in the past century of discovery, there can be no doubt there has to be a creator. With just the advances in science and exploration and study and seeing the irreducible complexity of even the tiniest of organisms. And the, take the DNA code. There's, there's no way this happens by accident. You look at everything we understand about plants and about the, the systems in the earth and animals and bugs. And, there's no way this stuff happens on its own. The only people who can deny a god and a creator are very religious people. Do you know what their name, name of their group is? It's called atheists. The religion of atheism. I don't have enough faith to join that religion. Amen. There has to be a God. So the, we understand that there is a God. There has to be, when you look at the, the force and the power just in the earth and in the heavens, there has to be a force great. Oh, no, I'm calling God a force. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a being more powerful than all of that to put that all into place. There has to be. It's, I often refer to it as the uncaused first cause. You know, we see the laws of nature that every, every event has to be caused by something. You know, if I pushed you down on the ground, what caused you to be on the ground? Well, I pushed you. Well, there has to be something that put all this into place. And we all know this, unless we've been deceived by the religion of atheism. We all know this deep down. There is a God. If you turn back over to Romans chapter 1, I hope I, nobody gets offended. This collar is a little bit too tight on me anymore, and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. I <laughs> Grace, brother, Grace. Look over at uh, verse 20 there in Romans chapter 1. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the creation is screaming at us, there is a God. He exists. We know that God is. We know it. Remember what, when Moses was talking to God, and he said, when I go talk to the Israelites, who, who should I tell them you are? What is your name? And he says in Exodus chapter 3, he says, and God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. I exist. I am. There is only one. Amen. He didn't say, I'm one of many. I am. Amen. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, he goes on to explain it, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. I am. 
There's only one, that same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we know this. We, the created beings, know that He is. But we often in situations where we don't know who He is. Who is God? We know there has to be one, but who is He? And as you saw there in Romans, people who even knew Him at the beginning of creation did not want to glorify Him as God. Didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. In verse 21 he says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they th thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They became college professors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the academe. <laughs> but that, that is what we want to deal with today. Who is God? And there's no way in the world I'll be able to get through God and His attributes in one installment on a Sunday morning. Not possible. I want to hit the overview of it though. But we want to be established. We want to be built up in the faith. We don't ever want to be a candidate to be one of the professing, I'm wise and you're a fool, do we? So we need to be rooted and established in these things. If you look over, we can learn a lot from Paul when he went up to Mars Hill, which I've said before is like the equivalent of the Oprah Winfrey show in his day. He got on Oprah, but Oprah's not even on daytime anymore, is she? Who's the big name on daytime now? Ellen? Okay, so this is like Paul on the Ellen show. But he gets a chance to go up and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ in front of the greatest men and the greatest minds of his day. And he talks about God, and he's, in verse 23, did I not say what book? It's hard for me to wonder how I get worse at this the longer I do this. <laughs> the book of Acts, chapter 17, and we'll start in verse 23. Acts chapter 17, verse 23. Now Paul gets his shot. He's on the big stage. And the first thing he says is he says in verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Him declare I unto you ignorantly worship. They know that there's a God. And in this case, you know, they, they had inscriptions and altars and everything to all the gods that they knew about. But they said, if we missed one, here's one for him too. So they don't know. They ignorantly worship. They didn't know who God was. Paul says, him declare I unto you. So what's the first thing that we learn about God from this verse? He's a he. All the people worshiping Diana are instantly mad. We know God is a she. But the first thing Paul says is God is a he. So instantly he's lost a good chunk of the crowd. But that's a fact. God refers to himself as a he. The other thing that we see from this verse, he says, I'm going to explain him to you. I'm going to declare him to you. So this creator, Paul is saying, it's possible to know him. You, the created being, can know who he is, the creator God of the universe. And not only that, you can know him well enough to tell others about him, who he is. That's what Paul's saying right there in that verse. 
So it's possible. It's not that this God is so far away and will not have any interactions with his creation. Paul's saying you can know him and tell others about him. And in, in, back in the book of John, we're going to be all over the Bible here, and I'm not going to have you turn to every verse for time's sake, but back in John chapter 17, it's the actual Lord's Prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ is praying it. And he says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You can know God. Now let's move on to the next verse in, in Acts. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What can we learn about God from that one verse? I'm going to put some theological terms on the board. This is a word we don't use in our daily conversation that much. I know I didn't use it all week this week. Omnipotent. Do any of the kids have an idea what the word omnipotent means? Blank stares. Okay. <laughs> omnipotent means you are all powerful. He put the heaven and the earth into being. That's a kind of power we can't understand. He is all powerful. And you think about it, we can't even understand really the power that's there in creation. We can't even wrap our minds around that. When you talk about glaciers moving across wide swaths of land, ripping up rock and moving millions of tons of... We can't even understand that kind of power. That's the power that's in the creation. How much farther and above is the power that put it into existence? It's got to be a higher power than that because cause and effect. So we can't... We can't even, you know, it's like trying to wrap your mind around eternity. Right. You ask me to explain eternity. <laughs> I can't wrap my mind around forever. That's the kind of power we're talking about, infinite power. That is resident in God. And in Revelation 19 and verse 6, John says, And I heard... As it were the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Another way to think about that is, if you're ever on the wrong side of a dispute with God, you're going to lose. He is all-powerful, so doesn't it behoove us to be on Team God? rather than in opposition to this God, because he's going to win. Psalm chapter 33 and verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He didn't need tools. He didn't need raw materials. He spoke and everything leaped into exi existence by his word. Do you see why I'm always harping on don't mess with God's word? <laughs> it's powerful enough to speak everything into existence. Amen. It's, you know, I, I have to walk my dog every night to keep him from getting any fatter. And <laughs> this time of year, you know, as I look off into the east, I see. Orion rising in the sky every night. And I just, you know, look at that constellation and those stars and just everything out there. And God spoke and whew, it's there. It's the kind of power that's just, you can't wrap your mind around it. That's the best way I can, I can say it. <laughs> so we've learned that God is a he and God is all powerful. What else can we see in that verse? 
God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So he is the creator. But pantheism is wrong. He is the creator, but he's separate and apart from his creation. God is not the creation. God is what put creation into place. Psalm 33, 13 says, The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So God is not a force that's in us all. And we just have to tap into the God energy. No, God is not you. God is not me. He's separate and apart from us. Look over it, please, if you would, here at this verse. It's not far away. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16. Colossians 1 and verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now think about that. This was written nearly 2,000 years ago. How many th invisible things did people not know existed at that time? How many things do we know exist that are invisible to our naked eye now? We now know. See, our science is finally catching up with the Bible. <laughs> yeah. What if we discover just in the oceans in the past 2,000 years that we didn't know were there? All these things were there. Visible and in invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Before all things. Now think about that. We live in a world of space, time, and matter. So God is a being that can operate outside of space, time, and matter. He is so powerful, he put space, time, and matter into place, separate from him. He's separate from his created beings, but he's also the sustainer of his entire creation. You know, I know that people worry that our SUVs out in the parking lot are going to destroy the planet. But God put a machine in place that sustains itself and keeps going. And when we mess up our environment, the environment comes and cleans up our mess for us. You think about that giant oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. They said the, the Gulf's going to be destroyed and the beaches are going to be destroyed for 20 years. The ocean chewed it up, cleaned it up itself. So he's that powerful. But look at verse, back in Acts, look at verse 25. He's separate and apart from us. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He doesn't need us. Did you catch that in that verse? As if he needed anything. God does not need us. We need him. Amen. He giveth to all life. He is the source of all life. Do you know that's one of the biggest questions that's driving scientists nuts right now? No matter how many experiments they run, no matter how they set up all the basic building blocks for simple life, no matter how perfectly they set up their experiments to have the conditions just right for life to appear, they can't get anything to come alive. 
We've done everything right. Why don't I have a one-celled organism? They can't make life appear. All, all the dead things that we find, you, know, you find a dead human being. You know what's sitting there? All the basic fundamental building blocks for life. But I can't make it come alive. It's dead. Because God is the source of all life. What that, what that is is the scientific concept of biogenesis versus abiogenesis. Abiogenesis means life can spring forth from dead things. That's a religion. <laughs> but everything we see and have ever seen is biogenesis. Life can only come from life. And that's what Paul is saying there. God is the source of all light. He's the power, the source, the creator of any and everything that has ever been and will ever be alive. You find that spoken about in John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And when you think about things like this, when you think about these, you know, this is like a 30,000 foot view of who God is here. You think about all these things about him. It's a lot harder to take his name in vain in a sentence, isn't it? When you talk about who he is. Another thing that we can learn from this verse, God that made the world and all things therein. Turn on your Discovery Channel when you go home. Watch the Blue Earth show. Watch one of those nature shows. What can we learn about who God is just from looking at the world and all things in it? Oh, I'm running right, right out of the board here. Our God is unbelievably creative. I put uncomprehensible level of creativity. When you think about all the different things in our world, you're talking about a level of creativity, again, that you can't wrap your mind around. We look at things our children do, and, oh, so you're so creative. How did you come up with that from this? You think about just the earth, the soil, rocks, grass, plants, flowers, trees. I mean, how many different types of flowers are there in the world? How many different colors? How many different shapes? Mosses, algae, ornamental grass. All these different things, you have to just stand back and say, this is an amazing level of creativity. They, I think they're up to animals now. They're saying, well, there's at least that we know of. There's about 9 million different species of animals in the world. Whoa. You talk about from microscopic little bugs to elephants and everything in between. A mind thought up every single one of those things and spoke it into existence. Each one of them, again, with irreducible levels of complexity and the way they live and eat and operate and procreate, a mind thought of all those things designed every single system and every single one of those animals. And it's, again, you can't wrap your mind around it. You go, start with amphibians, all the different amphibians, then move up to birds, then how about lions, tigers, and bears, oh my! <laughs> the mind 
that can create all these things is unbelievable. Think about sound, just sound. All the different types of sounds there are, all the different things that cause sound, music, rhythm, all the scales of music. A mind thought of all those things, put that into existence. Think about color. There are three primary colors, aren't there? Out of three primary colors, you can make about 10 million different shades of color. A mind put all that into place and created all that. What about just consciousness? I think, therefore I am. The different types of consciousness and awareness, emotions. Man, we can do a lot on that one, right? <laughs> just, I mean, intellect, memory, love. A mind created all those things. It's unbelievable. Physical senses, our physical senses. A mind put those things in place, thought of those things. You can't ponder the infinite level of creativity that can not only think of all those things, but speak them all into existence and have them operate in an orderly manner. That's not enough. Let's keep going. Anybody's mind boggled yet when you stop and think about, yeah, this is who God is. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. What we talk about now is not only creativity, but the kind of intelligence trying to create artificial intelligence with computers now. And everybody's afraid that, like in the Terminator movie, the robots are going to turn against us and take over the world. But when we're talking about God, the infinite level of intelligence that has to be there to create just what we see in our finite world. Again, we can't wrap our minds around it. The word, the theological term is omniscient. God is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows everything about everything. I know you think your wife does, but no. God knows everything about everything. <laughs> Only men are laughing. Funny, huh? <laughs> but omniscience. Omniscience means you have infinite awareness, infinite understanding, infinite insight. Does our Bible talk about that anywhere? I've got a couple for you. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and of great power His understanding is infinite. And again, you go back to cause and effect. Something infinite has to be the cause of the finite. Something greater than the finite has to be the cause, has to be the creator, and has to understand and design everything that is and sustain it. Hebrews uh, 4 verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. Everything. From the earthworms under the ground to the weird fish at the bottom of the ocean to the uh, goats hiding in a cave somewhere on a mountaintop. He sees all of it. Every, he knows everything about everything, where everything is, what everything is doing at all times. 
That's who God is. Let's take it even farther, though. Who God is. What does God know about? In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, in verse 9, it's even farther than that what God knows in His omniscience. What about God knows what's going through your brain every second of every day? All seven billion brains on this planet, oh, I just made the flat earthers mad. <laughs> You're not supposed to call it a planet. <laughs> All seven billion brains in this world, God knows every thought that's going through every brain all day, every day. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, he says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou that the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord, Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Now, we can't watch three people on a cable news show talk over each other and understand what's going on. God knows all things that's going on in everyone's mind and heart at all times. Can't, again, you can't wrap your mind around it. This is the God of the Bible. How about even farther than that? God's omniscience spreads to he knows everything that has ever happened and will ever happen long before it happens. Now, you, when you think about how many billions of people have lived lives and how many trillions of free will choices have to be made from generation to generation to generation, to generation and this God knows the sum total of billions of lives and trillions of free will choices where it's going to end up. Again, I can't wrap my mind around it. But our Bible says that is the extent of his knowledge. In Isaiah 46, 9, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. Yeah, I'm starting to see that. <laughs> I'm starting to get my head wrapped around that fact. There is none like you. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times those things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> all powerful, omnipotent, created all things. He's not part of us, he's separate from us. He's the source of everything that's ever been alive. He's uncomprehensively creative with infinite intelligence. Yeah, pretty sure you're going to get your way. Pretty sure, but safe bet. That's who God is. And again, we haven't even started on many of his attributes, but we're just talking about generally who this being is, who this person is. Let's look at, there's one more thing that we can hit on this week before I run out of time. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. What can we see about this God? One more thing from this verse. You know, every time we have an election and the most powerful man in the world comes from one party or another. And half of the people say, oh, no, don't give that much power to that person. And the other half say, oh, no, don't give that much power to that person. When we're talking about this level of power, I want to know something about him. And I see right there in that verse that God is giving. He's giving. Do you see that? He doesn't need anything from us, but he gives to all. Amen. 
We haven't even talked about God's love. We haven't seen any, but we know from that verse, this being, this person is giving to people he doesn't need anything from. Now think about that. Even us in our fallen humanity, we know what it's like to give to somebody where you're pretty sure it's coming back around. <laughs> right? Oh, Christmas is all about giving. Yeah, yeah. We'll make you get no presents for five years and see if you like Christmas anymore. Right? <laughs> Christmas is about getting. <laughs> That's what it's about. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got you this wonderful $500 watch. Yeah, I didn't get anything for you. How's that going to go down next year? <laughs> but this God is giving to people he doesn't get from or need anything from. That's, if he's giving in that way, the fact that he's giving to people and things he doesn't need anything from, what should that tell us? That this amount of power is in the right place. If he's giving, then he's inherently good. He must be good if he's giving to people he doesn't need anything from. He must be inherently kind. He must be loving. Can we find anything about that in our Bible? All over the place, yeah. But in, in James chapter 1, and again, I know I'm jumping all over the Bible here, crossing dispensations and thousands of years, but I'm just going here to get definitions. In the book of James chapter 1 and verse 17, he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So he's good, he's kind, and he's giving, and he's not going to change. Amen. Now you understand how grace can come about after thousands of years of people's failure. He's much better than we aren't. I was talking to Paul earlier, and I said it's a good thing that I wasn't God at the end of the book of Matthew. Because <laughs> my response would have been, okay, kablooey. <laughs> Instead, God's response was abundant grace. Whoa. Look over, this will be the last verse today. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse eight. Makes you happy that the all powerful, omniscient creator of all things and sustainer of all things is not a bad guy, doesn't it? But he says in this verse, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. That's a good thing to know about God. Amen. Especially, you know, we were talking about the Greeks and the Athenians there. When you look at the crazy gods and their legends, we talk about Zeus and Thor, I mean, the real God is not like any of those crazy people. Or even go to the Vikings, you know, the Viking and the Norse mythology. Hopefully we get to die and go to Valhalla, where we can get drunk and have more battles with Odin. Okay, the real God is not like that. The real God is good and kind and loving, and he's not going to change. If God is giving, God is good. If God is good, He must be trustworthy. Think about that when you're commanded to trust Him as complete and sufficient payment for your sins. Trust His death, burial, and resurrection. Is He trustworthy? Yes. 
If God is giving, God is good. God is good, God is trustworthy, then God is righteous. That's who God is from a view of about 30,000 feet. And we'll do more uh, delving into his attributes in the future. But when someone asks you, who is God? That's where you can start. This is who God is. The God you know is there. That's all I have for this week. Right on time, by the way, ma'am.